I want to rewind exactly one year ago, hmm. uh, around this time at Davos, you issued a dire warning about climate change, about the fact that emissions are still going up, and you called for urgency in addressing this issue. Mm -hmm. Has anything changed since 12 months ago? It's gotten worse. Uh, but, you, you know, uh, balancing the appropriate sense of urgency w with uh, the legitimate uh, hope that we can solve this crisis is really an important task because there, there are some people that go straight from denial to despair uh, without pausing on the intermediate step of actually dealing with the crisis. And that's actually where we are right now. But in order to deal with it, it really is important to, to understand the severity of the danger that we face. And, you know, that part of the message is uh, difficult for, for many people to hear for natural, understandable reasons. But you hear this phrase, existential risk. It is... Uh, that and more. And just to briefly define what the nature of the crisis is, uh, we are uh, spewing uh, 162 million tons of uh, human-caused heat-trapping pollution into the sky every day. And when I say into the sky, it's the thin blue shell, the part of the sky that's blue because it's the oxygen that makes it blue. Uh, and it's thin enough that if you could drive a, a car straight up in the air at uh, Autobahn or interstate highway speeds, you would get to the top of that blue line in five to seven minutes. You could walk it in an hour. Uh, it's that thin. And it's that thin shell that we're using as an open sewer for the gaseous waste of our civilization. And the, the, the molecules involved with greenhouse gas pollution, principally CO2, but also methane, and there's some others in smaller uh, amounts, uh, percentages. But, but the average uh, molecule of a greenhouse gas that we put up there every day lingers there for about a hundred years, which means it mounts up. The, um, the amount continues to accumulate and it traps heat. You know, we get the energy from the sun in the form of light and uh, the earth is heated up and then it's re-radiated into space as infrared and some of the outgoing infrared is naturally trapped by the natural greenhouse gas layer, uh, which is good because it keeps temperatures within boundaries that are appropriate and uh, conducive to the flourishing of life on Earth, including human life. Uh, but we are we're building up the amount of heat trapping capacity so much that today we trapped as much extra heat as would be released by 750,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding on the Earth every 24 hours. So are you? Are you? I, I, I know. I know. We I, and I'll, I'll try not to to, to a filibuster here. But I but I want to put it in context because it has to do with that balance between hope and despair that I, that I want to hit hit correctly because it's really important. You don't want to turn turn people off. We can solve this, but but it's important to understand what's happening, and and that extra heat uh, is raising temperatures threatening to make much larger areas of the Earth physiologically unlivable, generating a massive flow of climate refugees migrating across international borders, as many as a billion in this century, according to the Lancet Commission, melting the ice. A, a study reported in uh, the journal Nature yesterday recalculates the amount of ice on Greenland that's melting 30 million tons per hour. I mean, this is crazy stuff, what, what we're what we're doing. Uh, and the melting ice raises sea level. It's threatening to, uh, it's already slowed the Gulf Stream, which is part of this larger ocean conveyor belt, as they call it. Uh, and some are worried that it will shut down, which would be utterly catastrophic, threatening to thaw the 
frozen permafrost, which makes up three, uh, two, one third of the landmass in the northern hemisphere, which could trigger a kind of a runaway situation. So it's very, very dangerous stuff. Uh, last year was the hottest year ever by the largest margin of increase ever. Half of the days last year in 2023 were above 1.5 degrees, which is what the scientists say we should stay below. Two days in November were, were two degrees above pre-industrial. Uh, tropical diseases are driven to the higher uh, latitudes. The storms are getting much stronger every night on the TV news is like a nature hike through the book of Revelation. Uh, we're, we're seeing the rain bombs and the floods and the mudslides and the same extra heat is causing the droughts which are threatening uh, agricultural production. Uh, the, the, the food system is at a higher level of risk of, of multi-breadbasket failure than we could ever have imagined was possible. Uh, we're, we're seeing uh, uh, fires, uh, eight and, 18 and a half million hectares burned in uh, Canada th this year, 45 million acres. Uh, crazy. My farm in Tennessee, we were breathing smoke from the fires in Canada. You've seen in New York uh, where your, your newspaper is located. I mean, you know, it looked like, uh, it, I mean, it's, it, it's amazing. Uh, so these things are driving public uh, concern ap appropriately, uh, but here's the good news, okay? We have the ability to solve this. We really do. And some of the new scientific findings are very optimistic and ex exciting. If we reach, uh, sorry to turn my back on you all, if we reach true net zero and stop adding to the amount of this heat trapping gas up there, the temperatures will stop going up almost immediately with a lag of as little as three to five years. And even more exciting, if we stay at true net zero, half, 50% of all of the human-caused greenhouse gas pollution will fall out of the atmosphere in as little as 25 to 30 years. So and we can start the healing process. You talk about carbon removal. You don't want to build these ridiculous, giant, mechanical vacuuming machines in order, you know, the oil and gas industry. We could keep burning fossil fuels. Let's just capture the emissions as they go up there. Uh, it doesn't work for in a, in a realistic way for a reason we can go into. But we can let Mother Nature do the work for us. What goes up must come down. Obey the first law of holes. When you're in one, stop digging. So you're, you're saying this is possible, but we've known about all of this for quite some time. Why haven't we done it yet? Well, first of all, because it's hard, but second of all, it's not quite precise to say we've known all of the things that I just spooled out there for a long time. We have had these warnings in, in a more elliptical form from the scientists for quite a long time. You're quite right about that. And I've been trying to get this message out, interpreting the scientists' uh, warnings for decades now. And, uh, you know, I think that Due to the fact that the warnings they issued years ago turned out to be spot on accurate, should lead us to pay a little more attention to what they're saying will happen in the future if we don't implement the, the solutions that are available. And when I say they're available, just give me a second on this because it's an important part of the hope <laughs> message. The International Energy Agency says, and has documented this thoroughly, we don't have to wait for new technologies. There are some people who say, oh, we just need to do research and develop new technologies. I'm all for that. But we have everything we need today with proven deployment models to reduce uh, the greenhouse gas emissions by 50% in this decade. We have a clear line of sight to how we can get the rest of the, uh, the, the other 50% by mid-century. And we can solve this. Now, there's, uh, there are two big obstacles to it. Uh, the global system for allocating private capital uh, is, uh, discriminates against developing countries where most of the increase in emissions is due to come from. We have to, because of currency risk, if you're in Nigeria, you want to build a solar farm, which you will want to do because it's great for them, uh, you, your interest rates will be seven times higher than the interest rates paid here in Switzerland or in the U.S., 
Uh, and that means they are effectively blocked. And private capital is what's necessary. 86% of all the build-out of solar and wind is done with private capital. Last year, uh, worldwide, uh, if you look at all of the new electricity generation installed worldwide last year, 80% of it was solar and wind. In India, it was 93%. They're an outlier among the developing countries. That's the first obstacle. Second obstacle is that the least responsible actors among the petrostates and the fossil fuel companies are devoting an incredible amount of money and energy uh, and unethical passion into blocking progress. They have been standing in the way for decades. Uh, some of them engaged in, in outright massive fraud. It's been well documented. Your newspaper has reported on this. Uh, and and, and there, there have been books written about it, and it's not really challenged. You know, they used the blueprint from the tobacco companies when the Surgeon General's report alerted uh, doctors that smoking cigarettes causes lung cancer. They hired actors and dressed them up as doctors to go on camera and falsely tell people that uh, smoking is fine. The fossil fuel companies hired the same PR firms, the same uh, 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 pseudoscientists to go out and do the, the same thing. A and some of those zombie memes are still rattling around through the comment sections of every single uh, news publication or website in the world every time a climate article. And a new wave of climate denial has just been launched. You may have seen the study this week. And the American Petroleum Institute, the number one lobby uh, group for the American oil and gas firms, just announced a brand new uh, eight figure advertising campaign to convince the American people that it's impossible to transition away from fossil fuels. It's not fair to ask them to solve this crisis for us, but damn if it's not fair to ask them to stop blocking the efforts of everybody else to solve this. I'm sorry I press, I press my own buttons these days, so I can't help it, but go ahead. V VP Gore, I do want to pivot to politics because I've been talking with investors, business leaders all week. This is on everyone's mind. We have yeah, a big election coming up, and you've hailed the Inflation Reduction Act as one of the biggest mm -hmm. and best climate acts in history. Yeah. Are you afraid it could get re repealed or, or parts of it rolled back if Republicans gain control of Congress or Trump wins? <laughs> um. Well, first of all, I think that the Inflation Reduction Act is by far the best, uh, most lavishly funded climate legislation any country's ever passed. And uh, the, the sticker price or the estimates of how much it would deploy were in the $370 billion range. But the heavy lifting is done with tax credits that are open-ended, and the estimates now are as high as $1.2 trillion. Um, that's already creating a new political reality on the ground in, in the U.S. I went to a, an event in um, D.C. hosted by the trade group representing electric vehicle manufacturers and the lithium miners and the battery. So the lead-off uh, speaker was a MAGA Republican Trump supporter from coastal Georgia in Congress who had voted against certifying the election uh, in 2020. And he made a terrific speech touting the virtues of electric vehicles. Why? Maybe because the largest battery manufacturing uh, plant in, the, in North America is being built in his congressional district. And that story is being repeated all across the U.S., especially in the red states. And for reasons probably, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to go into all that, maybe labor law, maybe wages. But in any case, there are new re political realities being created on the ground. The, the Republican governor of Georgia was supposed to be here at Davos, I think he came, uh, promoting electric vehicles here. Uh, I, I mean, and so this is not a foregone conclusion. And by the way, uh, the, the, the filibuster in the Senate, which ought to be repealed, nevertheless stays in existence. It's way harder to repeal a law after it's been passed. And when you have increased political support for a very popular set of programs that the IRA has uh, initiated. I, I think that uh, the odds are, e even if uh, we, we saw uh, the change in the presidency that you referred to, I try not to use that name, uh, uh, then I, I, I think that uh, it, it, it's not an automatic that it, that it is uh, 
that it, that it would be repealed. I think this is an inexorable uh, uh, change. Uh, solar and wind energy is the cheapest electricity in the history of the world. And in 95% of the world today, it's the cheapest. And it doesn't have the co-pollution, the particulate pollution that kills more than 8 million people a year with lung diseases. Oxford uh, shows that it creates three times as many jobs per dollar invested as a dollar invested in the old, dirty, poisonous fossil, fossil fuel economy. So uh, it is moving really fast on uh, electric vehicles. 20% of all the new vehicles sold worldwide last year were electric. If you look at two-wheelers, 50% were electric. And you have battery swapping models there, and it's really taken off in the developing world as well. Uh, green hydrogen is beginning to get a lot of traction, regenerative agriculture and sustainable forestry. And the younger generation, by the way, 60% of young Republicans are, are, are really breathing fire about this. They want their party to change. 60% of the American people generally say this has to be a top priority. So I, I think we're, it's, we're going to solve this. The, the serious question, though, is whether or not we will solve it in time. And so dire warnings coupled with legitimate hope that we can do this are, are really appropriate. And here's the key to it. Um, Abraham Lincoln uh, uh, said famously that with the support of the people, everything is possible. Anything is possible. Without the support of the people, nothing is possible. Rudy Dornbush, an economist from the last century, who was a friend of mine, uh, has a law named after him, and here's how it goes. Things take longer to happen than you think they will, but then they happen faster than you thought they could. We are very close to a political tipping point, and the, those who are desperately uh, fighting against the proposal of transitioning away from fossil fuels are trying to block this, but we got a lot of things on our side. The technology tailwinds are amazing. And last year, in calendar year 2023, the cost of solar went down another 50% year on year. We, uh, we, we have Mother Nature is the loudest participant in this debate right now. Uh, and the increasing frequency and severity of these extreme events are really uh, causing a lot of people to look at their hold cards and say, yeah, I may not like the phrase uh, global warming or the word climate, but something's going on here, and we've got to take some steps to deal with it. That movement is inexorable. So you talk about Republican support, but you know when I turn on the TV or I, I, or I watch some of these Republican presidential candidates yeah. talk, they're talking about woke capitalism yeah. you know, and, and talking against it. Uh, you're course. seeing ESG become a dirty word in America. Companies mm. are rolling back some of their policies. People are pulling money from some of these environmental funds. Is this the beginning of the end of sustainable investing? <laughs> no, I don't think so at all. Uh, I, I, but, but first of all, let me say the explanation for a lot of the politicians you see on camera. Very simple, actually. The, the fossil fuel companies are way better at capturing politicians than emissions. Uh, and the the unhealthy the unhealthy degree to which money drives political outcomes in uh, a media-based uh, political communication system where the candidate with the most money more often than not wins, not always, but more often than not, then the role of lobbyists uh, uh, and uh, special interests money uh, is is extremely unhealthy, and that's the cause of this. Now, and that's what's driving the talk against woke capitalism. You think? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. Uh, now, it's got it's absurd, really. Well, first of all, let me say this: uh, my my, uh, my my partner and co-founder at Generation Investment Management, David Blood, and I have published uh, 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 several op-eds in the Wall Street Journal, and the last one we published dealt with this specific issue. And for anybody who wants m more than I'm going to say briefly here, you can look it up online. Uh, but actually, the, the way ESG 
has been rolled out is filled with problems. And we, we weren't really surprised that it ran into difficulties because it has been used a, in, by some as a, uh, you know, in a, in a really uh, almost a greenwashing uh, way. And so it's not surprising that it ran into problems. But what you're finding w with uh, some of the large institutional investors getting scared of it is a direct result of captured politicians in red states uh, taking instructions from the fossil fuel uh, overlords <laughs> that control their views on these things to threaten uh, the um, uh, asset managers by saying, I if you don't stop talking about climate, we're going to prevent you from managing our pension fund. And it gets to the point that's so ridiculous that uh, here's, a, here's an example. A, an asset manager is looking at a potential investment, and the company has what looks like it might be a big liability for a Superfund site of hazardous chemical waste that may cost several billion dollars. It becomes illegal for them to even consider that in analyzing the pros and cons of that investment. And because that's so obviously absurd, Republicans as well as Democrats, and this has been polled extensively, Republicans as well as Democrats are saying, hands off this, stop this nonsense. And actually, and some Republic, a few Republican office holders in this arena who have not been captured are saying, this is stupid. Let's don't do this anymore. So it, it'll play out, uh, and, and we'll get past this. But the, but the way ESG is defined it has to be sharpened uh, considerably. Will generation investment management keep using the term, or do you guys plan to? Yeah, sure. We've we, we've never relied heavily on that term, but we're not afraid of it. Sure, we we look at all of our uh, investments uh, and every aspect of the investing process through a sustainability lens, and it's not limited to to climate, but that is a major factor. Uh, and you know, um, the world is moving, and there's an oft. Uh, used a, a story about the best ice hockey player in American uh, history, Wayne Gretzky, who was a phenomenal. And when he was interviewed and asked, uh, what's your secret? Why are you so much better than everybody else? And you may have heard this. He said, well, it's very simple. I don't skate to where the puck is. I skate to where the puck is going to be. Uh, and in investing, uh, uh, if you have good teams and good data, uh, and you, you really work hard to make uh, your best estimates of where the puck's going to be, then that's a pretty good uh, uh, source of advantage if, if, you, if you do it well. And the, 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 pu the metaphorical puck here is that uh, the world is shifting toward sustainability uh, for lots of reasons. Uh, Companies represented here, you talk to your HR, you already know this, you don't have to talk to your HR head to, uh, to know this. When you're trying to hire the, the best uh, young women and men coming into the firm, they're interviewing you now is the same time you're interviewing them. And if, if they feel that you don't share their values, including uh, a, a shared commitment to try to avoid destroying the future of humanity, uh, then they're going to go work for some other firm that does. Uh, and a lot of investors who are not scared off by this kind of political nonsense are saying, yeah, look, we want to put our money to work in a way that gets good returns, but we don't think you have to sacrifice value for values. We see the world changing, too, and we want to put our money to work in support of these companies that are placing bets on where that buck's going to be. It just feels like the winds are kind of shifting in terms of all this. And I think DEI is a really good example of this. That's part of socially responsible investing. Mm -hmm. And one of the best examples of this is Claudine Gay, uh, Harvard's first <laughs> black president in its 400-year history just stepped down. And, and her harshest critics said she only got there because of her race. You know, can the DEI movement s survive this moment that we're in politically? Well, I'm not sure it's fair to lock in on the assumption that that's the only reason she was hired. She, 
uh, I'm not an expert on this and haven't really delved into That's what her critics are saying. I understand, yeah. but, but I've also heard many talk about the, her distinguished uh, record of scholarship. Certainly. Now, she yeah. had so many instances of plagiarism. I mean, you know, they, I mean, <laughs> obviously it was a problem. I'm just saying that's put DEI in the spotlight, and now people are trying to roll back yeah. some of those policies. Yeah, but I would separate that case where I think Harvard ended up making the right decision, clearly. And by the way, I was among the many that was shocked at the tone deafness of the testimony before Congress when this, when this came up. I, you know, they had, all three of them apparently had the same lawyer. Uh, evident, I'm not, poor guy, I don't know who his name is, but they got very bad legal advice in how they handled it. But let's talk more about DEI as a, uh, separate and apart from this one uh, case. In the United States of America, if you look at the average family wealth of a black family, and then you look at the average family wealth of a white family, you know what the difference is? The average black family has an average wealth one eleventh the, the, of an average white family. Why is that? Well, it's not a mystery. It's the accumulated legacy of uh, the institutional structural uh, discrimination and, and problems that ha have lingered for a long time after the horrors of slavery. And these things have just not gone away. We've made tremendous progress. Hallelujah, have we ever. But it's still there. <laughs> and... and on a business uh, level, uh, who was it making this case? Early? Oh, it was Mark Cuban uh, uh, in, in, um, in Dallas. And I really like the way he, he said it. He, he said, look, if you have different uh, hiring pools of people uh, and you recognize that one or more uh, pools have been ignored and passed over, maybe because of these legacy discrimination factors, it's only smart to recognize there are going to be some super talented people in that pool that haven't been hired by others and give you a tremendous opportunity to put some great talent on the, on the board. I, 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 I've seen that happen. It's definitely the case. So uh, I think that for uh, those two reasons and many others, uh, it, it is oh, another reason, another reason. Uh, Michael Maubusson, uh, you know, you, uh, great and professor, he teaches the course uh, at Columbia Business School. It used to be taught by Warren Buffett's uh, mentor, uh, uh, somebody can tell me. No, no, not Charlie. Charlie was his partner, and I, I miss Charlie. He just passed. Uh, but this, uh, Benjamin Graham, thank you very much. Uh, Maubusson teaches that course now. Great in, investor. Uh, and he has made a sideline of really researching deeply the benefits uh, of diversity in group decision making. Uh, and um, what he's found in his research that every uh, matrix, uh, all of, uh, every difference, gender, uh, uh, race, religion, ethnicity, uh, orientation, uh, every single difference adds to the, va the uh, efficacy of the group's decision-making process, except for one. Have, they have to share the same basic values. Um, I'll give you a quick uh, example from science. Um, I'm prone to use these geeky metaphors sometimes to, to a fault. But uh, one, I took one of my daughters years ago out to, she's interested in science, and we went to the top of the volcano on the big island of Hawaii where they have the telescopes and the, the, the Kex uh, was, and for some purposes they said, well, now with the James Webb telescope, there, nothing's as powerful as that. But this is the most powerful telescope in the world, particularly for looking at supernovas. And they put all of these cutting-edge advances in, uh, and segmented mirrors and software and all of this. But the thing that caught my attention is they did two identical telescopes 60 meters apart. And here's the thing that's startling. When they look at an object in the universe 100 
million light years away. The fact that they're looking at it from two different points of view, a mere 60 meters apart on the surface of a small planet, makes all the difference in the amount of meaning that can be gained from that observation. The same thing is true when you have someone from an underrepresented minority or a, 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 enough women, because the main diversity that shows up in the research is you got to have women's intelligence alongside men's intelligence. Hard to believe, I know, uh, because men have done such a great job in screwing up this world. But, but, but if you have those differences, then your ability to reason together collectively is going to be enhanced. You're going to make better decisions. There are people who are for diversity but against DEI. You know, I'm, I'm an Indian American woman. If someone said to me, you only got that position because of your race, that would be incredibly distressing. But that's what critics are saying these DEI policies mm. are leading to. You know, is that fair to the people that these policies are, that are selected to uplift? Yeah, it's an, you know, I think that is a factor. And, and I, I, I know people who've made the same point that you just made. Uh, and that can be kind of a psychological burden. That's what you're saying, right? You know, why did I get this position? You know, I think that we're almost kind of beyond that by now because everybody knows that uh, there's such an advantage to having a diverse workforce that I don't think that's as big a deal as it might have been and at sometimes in the past. And in any case, I think we have a societal moral obligation and uh, practical imperative to try to get uh, the U.S. past these uh, horrific uh, problems that are rooted in the past and the younger generation. I mean, you know, it's very, it's very different for, for the younger generation. At least, at least that's my impression. Same, same with, uh, like, the discrimination against gays and lesbians. You know, young people, they say, what? <laughs> you know, are you serious? You're going to discriminate against somebody because of who they fall in love with and how they were, uh, the way God made them? Uh, really? Uh, and uh, I think that as we gain more experience uh, in, in accepting the reality of who we are as human beings, I think, you know, we, we, can, we can get past that. I want to open it up to the audience for questions, so please get thinking and raise your hands. I just have one more for VP Gore. Mm. Um, you recently stepped down from Apple's board because of a provision, I believe, that states that people at or above 75 cannot um, be up for re-election. Do you think, at 75 year, years old, that you are too old to be on <laughs> no, Apple's <I> board? <laughs> no, I don't. No, I don't. But, but uh, the age was was raised while I was on the board. So I got an extension anyway. And, and since my birthday is in March and the annual meeting is in February, I got an extra year out of that deal too. Amazing. So I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna complain. And you know, uh, it, it has been such a blessing uh, to, to serve for 21 years on the Apple board. When, when I left the, the White House involuntarily, uh, 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 <laughs> my, my friend, uh, my friend uh, Steve Jobs called me up and asked me to join the board. I had met him uh, in the 1970s when, as a young member of the House of Representatives, I sponsored the Apple computer, the computer donate to schools legislation, and we've been friends for a while. And, and uh, it, has, it is such a great company. Tim Cook is such a great CEO. My colleagues uh, are remaining on the board are fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. And the new board member is going to be a, an absolute superstar. So I love Apple with all my heart, and I, I encourage everybody to invest in Apple. Love it. Um, I think you raised your hand, and we have mics going around as well. And if you could just introduce yourself before Hello. we ask your question. My name is Constantine. I'm an investor from Germany. I'm Mr. Vice President, thank you for the Macintosh in my dorm. <laughs> I loved it. Recommend to everyone. I was the only one in the Clinton Gore White House with a Macintosh, by the way, so I'm with you. <laughs> you mentioned the help from Mother Nature. What about help from the free, the invisible hand of the market? So the invisible hand of the market that is referred by the economists. What stops us from using tradable emissions and having market resolve mm. the, much of the issue. Yeah. 
Well, I want to answer your question in two ways. First of all, uh, I am not opposed to carbon credits uh, being traded in markets. However, the record of the past years has been a record uh, that has had way too much uh, abuse in it. Uh, it is not uncommon to examine closely the, the, the emissions credits that are sold and find that upwards of 90 percent are fraudulent and, and are just junk. They analyzed Chevron's uh, um, uh, offsets and found 93 percent were worthless or junk was the, was the conclusion. Now, I think it would be a big mistake to conclude from that record of abuse that's all t that has been all too common that we can't use such <coughs> markets. I think we, we should be able to, to use them. But we have to have safeguards and standards to, to protect the integrity of those markets. Okay. Now, second thing I want to say, and um, you started talking about the invisible hand. There is a deeper uh, problem with, with um, the way we measure what is valuable in our economy. Uh, and this is difficult to solve. When I was on the Joint Economic Committee in the, in the Senate, I tried to solve this. Gingrich came in. They eliminated the program. But the national accounts, which include uh, GDP, which is the most famous part of it, and the corporate accounting systems that are derived from the national accounts date back to the 1930s. After the Great Depression, economists tried to give policymakers better tools to avoid another depression. Simon Kuznets was the famous award-winning economist who came up with the national accounts. And in 1937, when he received the award, he made a series of speeches in which he pleaded with policymakers, please don't use this system as a guide for national economic policies. And then seven years later in Bretton Woods, it was codified and locked in, and now it's like the QWERTY keyboard. It no longer makes sense, but we're used to it, and we can't get away from it. What did he say was wrong with it? This is important, and it's important to understand how wacky our value measurement system is today. It's because it's a big, big part of the problem. He said there are four things that are not included in the measurements that we rely on. Number one, fairly well known, negative externalities. We've all heard that phrase. Pollution falls into that category. When a, when a corporation or a government uh, does the accounts, eh, just ignore the pollution. That's a negative externality. Less well known is the second factor, positive externalities. If a community invests in mental health care, that is logged as an expense in the town's budget. When the benefits come rolling back in in the years and decades to follow, that's not counted as income. So if, you're, if your dashboard says we got to get the deficit down to zero and this expense is not bringing us any measurable benefits, then that's excluded. The third one is depreciation of natural resources. Think about topsoil and underground water aquifers and, most important of all, the web of living species which is now in, at dire risk, not counted at all. The fourth factor is the distribution of incomes and net worths. And that's not a choice between capitalism and socialism. That is a set of choices that involve taxes and uh, policies and monopoly uh, enforcement and so forth. So now, as a result of this wacky value system that's embedded in the way we decide what's valuable, you know the old saying, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Uh, there's a similar syllogism. If the only tool you have for measuring what's valuable is a price tag, things that don't have any, any price tag begin to look like they have no value. So today, GDP goes up 3%. China claims it just went up 5.2%. And it's accompanied by vast increases in pollution, a continuing chronic underinvestment uh, in education, mental health care, health care, environmental protection, pandemic preparedness, the protection of nature, the, the, the reckless depletion of topsoil on which our future agriculture depends, and groundwater, which is being recklessly, and uh, half of all living species at risk of extinction in the lives of people in this room, and the emergence of hyper-inequality, 
not only in developed but also developing countries with most of the income going to the very top end of the ladder with most of the middle income working families seeing no inflation adjusted increase in wages for 45 years. So of course some of them are going to say, uh, you know, you want me to vote for some outrageous monster who threatens to turn over the table? Sounds good to me. Uh, and so we get this wave of authoritarian populism in the world, not just the threat of what might happen in the U.S. system, but in, in, in Hungary. And, you know, you get that uh, guy uh, getting a plurality in the Netherlands, and you can go through the list. And, and so we've got to find a way to get more accurate in taking into account what is really valuable when we make our decisions. Yes. Adnan Hassan, I live on a small island in the Caribbean, and they're in Bonaire, which is one of the Dutch islands. And we're looking at wind and solar and hydrogen as a way to replace fossil fuels. What's your view about the use of alternatives like hydrogen for smaller places that are isolated around the world? And we're not the only island. The islands all across the planet. And as we all know, we end up getting more impacted by the penalties, the externalities that are priced at zero. And also the, the climate-related extreme events, the hurricanes yeah, in absolutely. the Caribbean, uh, for example, and the sea level rise and the acidification and high temperatures that are killing your tourism industry by destroying the, the reefs and the lives around the reefs. Yeah. Uh, generally speaking, uh, having done s some analysis in this area, there are many people far more expert than me, but uh, generally speaking, all islands should immediately shift over to renewable energy. The economics of transporting diesel in from <laughs> far away, it's nuts. So, of course, you should be shifting. Now, the second part of your question had to do with green hydrogen. Um, you know, we need more electrolyzers uh, to make uh, green hydrogen from uh, breaking the bonds between hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, hydrogen used to be made mainly, still now, uh, used to be made mainly from fossil, from methane. Uh, but when you hear about solar and wind, you will often hear about the problem of intermittency. When the sun's not shining, the wind's not blowing, there are solutions to it, you know, and batteries are getting better. But intermittency is like a coin with a flip side. The flip side of the intermittency coin is that there are an increasing number of hours each day when there are l very large surpluses of renewable electricity that has zero marginal cost. It used to be that cracking the strong bonds uh, in water between hydrogen and oxygen required so much energy, it was too expensive to do it that way, so they went to the methane option. Now, when you, if you have enough zero marginal cost for renewable electricity, you can profitably break those bonds, and people are starting to do it. And so what the CapEx is for putting all that machinery and all the electrolyzers on Bonaire, you'll have to ask somebody else whether it makes economic sense. But, in ge but generally speaking, if you have an island economy that's wealthy enough uh, uh, to, to build out a huge amount of solar and wind quickly, it, I think it does make sense. Uh, to get the electrolyzers as well and, and go into the green hydrogen business. So we, we are almost out of time. I have one last question yeah. before I let you go. John Kerry recently stepped down as climate envoy. Would you raise your hand for the role? Uh, well, I'm flattered that you would ask, but uh, <laughs> no. Uh, I, I have, uh, you know, there's a, there's a pro-climate team out there uh, and there are different positions on the field that, n that need different kinds of players. Uh, I was in uh, government for a long time, uh, and I'm a recovering politician, and the longer I go without a relapse, the less likely one becomes. Uh, and uh, oh, one thing, by the way, let me just say uh, in answer to your question that John Kerry deserves the gratitude of all Americans and people around the world. He did a heroic job. I really do. And this may be mainly an American audience, but I want to add to that by saying Xi Jinhua, the principal Chinese climate negotiator for the last couple of decades, also deserves 
the, the gratitude of people around the world. Uh, he, he, he did a terrific job. And uh, John, he's quick to say he's not retiring. He's going to help uh, President Biden in his campaign, which he can't do under the Hatch Act if he's there. Uh, he put three years of terrific work in, into that job. And his successor is going to have to be confirmed by the Senate, unlike uh, when John, the law has been changed since John was appointed. But I'm sure that President Biden will be able to find a, a really good replacement. But uh, the world will miss John's uh, work in, in this area. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I'm sorry we couldn't get to oh, more Oh, can questions. I say one other thing before we close? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we can solve this crisis. We have everything we need. The one factor that people worry we may not have in sufficient quantity is political will. But the one thing to remember that I want to leave you with, because I came here not only to answer your questions and, and uh, help the Wall Street Journal's event business, uh, but, <laughs> but, but I, I also came here to recruit you. We need your help. And I'm dead serious. Some of you are already involved in this. Those of you who are not, you think back to what you thought about the climate crisis five years ago and compare it to what you know now and then project forward a few years, I guarantee you the difference is going to be starker still because it's getting worse faster than we're deploying the solutions. We have the ability to do it. And where political, the, the amount of political will necessary is concerned, please remember this always. Political will is itself a renewable resource. 